Let's open our Bibles. We're going to be in Exodus, but I want us to start off in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you'd like to stand for just the reading of a couple of verses here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. We've been trying to preach some about coming out of Egypt because we all have admitted that we have a problem of being too worldly. And we need to get the world out of us. And this week we're going to deal with bargaining with the devil, making some compromises. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, notice in verse number 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? And so the context, I believe, as we apply it to our message today, has to do with compromising. On the one hand, trying to live like the world and fellowship with the world, but then on the other hand, trying to follow and do God's will. Those things do not mix So here in Exodus 8, as we turn back, we'll get into the message. But I want to preach some about coming out of Egypt. And as we study Moses and the children of Israel, as they try to come out, Pharaoh, as a type of the devil, begins to make certain bargains and compromises with God's people. We dealt some with Moses and how that he realized he couldn't use the flesh to get out of the world. Yes, you have to resist the world, but you've got to rely on God, not on yourself. Some of you have some shackles on you. You've got some habits, some addictions, some things that you're just tied up with, and you're trying to break it by yourself. You cannot do that in the strength of your own will. Moses had to learn that. Moses had to learn, as we looked last week, when God calls you to come out of Egypt, you've got to be serious enough to turn aside and see, to open your ears and hear, and then take your shoes off. That's where you lose everybody. And then you have to claim your true identity. The reason behind this whole deal is that you are supposed to be a Christian. The whole point of coming out of Egypt was so they could worship God. And here we are this morning, I know we worship God in spirit and truth, we sing some songs about Him, we pray, we take up a collection, we try to do some things, but on a day-to-day basis, we are to live our lives worshiping and serving God. And you can't do that if you're in the world and the world's in you. It's just not going to work. And we saw that last time. So what takes place here, and you get in Exodus 5, 6, and 7, Obviously, Aaron's rod swallows up their rods, their snakes. You know the story. He turns the water of the blood, and you think that would freak them out enough to let the people go, but Pharaoh won't let the people go even after that. Then he sends these frogs. It's that time of the year. Do you hear all the frogs whistling at night? You know, and uh, with frogs come snakes. <laughs> I can imagine all the snakes that probably came with all these frogs. Man, that would have been a feast. But... The funny thing about these frogs is he tells Moses, we want to get rid of these frogs. I'll let you go. Moses says, all right, when you want to get rid of the frogs? He says, do it tomorrow. <laughs> and then you have the classic message that all the preachers preach, one more night with the frogs. Why didn't he say, get rid of them now? Yeah. It seems like from Exodus chapter number 7, verse 25, that there's a seven-day period for each of these judgments. That's what it looks like from verse number 25. But then you have the judgment of the lice. And the Bible says that he's hardened, he won't let them go. Then the flies come. And with that judgment of the flies, he puts a division between his people and the Egyptians. The flies do not plague God's people. So there's a severance going on. There's a a separation there. And then Pharaoh begins here in Exodus chapter number 8 to begin his bargaining and his compromising. You see, the devil is real good about that. The Bible says in Genesis 3 that he's more subtle than any beast of the field. So what he'll do is he'll make an allowance. In other words, he might put up with you coming on Sunday morning. might not really bother him all that much if he has you on Monday. And really, let's just be honest. What good does it come to walk? What, What good does it to come in church on Sunday when you're not changed on Monday? 
You pat yourself on the back. I attended church. Da, 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 da. All heaven is pleased. I walked in the doors of the church. The devil is a compromiser, and he will try to get you to compromise. So let's look at it in verse number 25 of Exodus chapter number 8. Four compromises. We'll get through these and hopefully learn some things to maybe help us to combat these compromises in our own lives. Look in Exodus 8 verse 25. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. Satan will use agreements you already have in the land. This is partial obedience, okay? He will use some type of alliance that you already have and try to make a compromise to get you to do what you're doing. Just don't make a break. Don't make a separation. So here's the compromise. It's the compromise of conformity. Just stay right where you are and just conform to the environment around you. The subtlety is this. He's actually telling him, we're going to let you do what God's told you to do. That's how subtle this is. It's positive. I mean, can't you worship God anywhere? What's the big deal? You actually come down to church at a particular time and you assemble when everybody assembles. Can't you just pray in the deer stand? Well, it's not deer season now, so I guess that's why some people are showing back up. Uh, Or can't you just pray out on a fishing boat? It's very subtle. Surely you can worship God anywhere. What's the big deal? What's the big deal that you put on your best clothes and walk in the church and you're on your best behavior and those kind of... What's the big deal? Let's just all wear our pajamas like they do at Walmart. There is a big deal to this. Because the idea that the devil's trying to do, he's trying to get them to take some positive truths. Yes, you can worship God. You can even worship God in Walmart. Matter of fact, if you don't know how to pray, if you have to go to that abominable place, you will learn how to pray... Lord, get me out of this line. But notice the sinfulness of it in verse number 23. It's a direct contradiction to what God's called them to do. He put a division between them. He put a division between His people and Egypt. And now Pharaoh's saying, let's don't have a division. Let's just bring everybody together and let's just do what you want to do out there here. I believe in the separation of church and state. 100%. I believe the state has no business telling us what to do. And consequently, I'm not going to go try to make a law for everybody to do what my convictions are. I'm an American as well. I'm a Christian first, but I'm an American. But I'm not some type of uh, a totalitarian that thinks that, okay, we've got to convert the world by forcing them to put laws in place that are Christian. This country never has been a Christian nation in the sense that it put the name of Jesus Christ on any founding document. Now, I can concede the fact that there's been a lot of Christians that have affected policy in America, but this is a godless country. And to try to mix the world, oh, we're going to convert the world, we're going to get in politics, and we've got to get all these Christians to vote, and we've got to convert the world. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to worship the world in the world, or worship God in the world? We just want to make it a better place. I'm leaving this place one day. And, and excuse my Bible English, but to hell with this world. Amen. To hell with it. Amen. That's exactly where it's going. Well, we just want to make this place, you know, we just want to do... Look, I understand if God gives you an opportunity, you can vote out a bill, vote out a bill. But spending all this energy and all this time into this world is a compromise that the devil's using to get you tangled up and tied up. All you're doing is listening to the politicians and you're listening to the laws. and You're not even reading your Bible anymore. More worried about what's going on in Washington than you are in heaven. I'm more interested in what you know, Peter, James, and John are doing up there on the throne and what the 24 elders are doing up there. Who cares what's going on down here? 
We've always been, as Christians, accused of being so heavenly minded. And you're supposed to be heavenly minded. Set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth, Colossians chapter 3. The snare of it is that Satan is the God of this world and he knows, in verse 26 Moses pegs him on this, he knows the Egyptians won't put up with it. He knows if they go ahead and start killing these animals that they worship, how dare, how dare you go and order venison? You mean you're going to kill an animal and eat it? Yeah, I'm going to kill it and I'm going to eat it and I'm going to enjoy it. But that's an abomination to us. We worship these cows. The Egyptians will pressure the Israelites eventually. If they stayed in Egypt long enough, we know what happened to Moses when he left. He looked like an Egyptian, remember? That's what his future father-in-law thought he was. They all thought he was an This Egyptian came to help us today. He's dressed like one. He's talking. He still had the Egyptian shoes on his feet when he went to see God last week when we studied. He said, get those shoes off. What are you doing bringing those Egyptian shoes in here? It's kind of like some of the churches, how they're bringing in the world into the church. Look, I know a lot of us are dirty. we got the world on us, but there comes a a time where you have to draw a line. How much of the world are you going to bring into church to try to make people feel comfortable? Do I need to be standing up here in a polo shirt just so you'll listen to me? Do I need to have an iPad and preach out of it just so you'll think I'm up to date? What do I need to say or not say just to bring people in here? Where do you draw the line? God says, I'm going to draw a division between my people and the Egyptians. But, but Pharaoh and, and the devil says, look, we don't need to do that because you can't reach people that way. You're going to isolate and separate people. See, so he'll always have a little bit of truth in what he says. But he knows eventually what will happen. And we see it in churches all over the place. What will happen eventually, the Egyptians will influence the Israelites. And they will quit sacrificing altogether. These dumb Christians, man. Just stupid. Just stupid, man. You remember Y2K came. Everybody went crazy. It came and it went. And these Christians, it's the same way with everything else that comes. The world starts feeding them all this stuff. You think you can't live without a smartphone. You think you can't live without social media. And what you've done is you've compromised your Bible reading time. You've compromised your family time around the table where you pray and where you have time to talk about God with some stupid phone, some technology where you've got all connected with the world now and you can't even connect with God and you can't connect with your family anymore. Bought it hook, line, and sinker. Why? Because you are a sheep. And I'm a sheep. Sheep are the dumbest animals in the world. Just follow each other right off the cliff. Here goes the world. Here, come follow us. Come follow us. Bloop, 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 bloop. The compromise of conformity. And Satan will use agreements that you already made as partial obedience. Here's a good illustration of why how Christians do it. Here's this spider, and he's got this nice web, and here's this fly buzzing by. He buzzes on by, and he comes, he comes through there, and, uh, and the fly says, Hey, why don't you come down here and have a seat? And the fly's like, Hey, I'm an intelligent fly. I'm not going to come in here in your spider's den over here and have a seat. He goes, Hey, look down there. The spider says, Look down there. There's all these flies are already here. And there's all these flies down there on this brown table. And uh, they're all down, down, down there dancing. And that fly says, oh, man, look at that. All these flies. And, man, they're having a good time down there. Dancing the jig and all this kind of stuff, you know. And uh, so he starts to head down there where those flies are. And this bee, this uh, big bumblebee buzzes by. He says, I wouldn't go down there if I was you. He said, what do you mean? They're all having, an, and I'm the only one that's up here. All those flies are down there. Everybody else is doing it. I wouldn't do that. Next thing you know, you know the rest of the story. He goes down, to the, down there to the brown, the brown uh, uh, dance floor, which is a uh, fly paper. <laughs> then he gets stuck on the fly paper with all the other flies. Then the spider just goes down there and gobbles them up. Compromise. Everybody else is doing it. They're all having a good time. That's what it looks like because their profiles and the stuff they're posting on their social stuff, everybody's always happy in the movies. They never show you the other side of the party. 
compromise of conformity. Let's look at the second one. It comes right after this one in verse 28. Pharaoh says, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away. Entreat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Look in verse 28. This is the compromise of correspondence. In other words, Satan will use your associations to stay connected. He says, don't go very far, verse 28. Just don't go very far. It's okay to be a little bit fanatical. You know, it's okay to, 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 to serve God a little bit, but don't go off the deep end. You're reading your Bible too much. Now you're certain things you're not wanting to do that we all like to do all the time, and now you're condemning us because you're saying it's wrong, and, and you're just getting you're just holier than that. Now what, what's wrong with you? To sacrifice or a compromise of correspondence. Don't go very far away. Little kids, you'll notice how they get real connected to things, and it's easy for that to happen. And that's what Satan does. He wants you to stay connected. And it's so hard, especially in our culture, because a lot of, with jobs and different things, you have to be connected, you have to be in the loop. But what he'll do is he'll try to get you to stay connected. And little kids, they'll get connected to stuff. They have their little blanket that they have all the time or whatever, or their little, little bear. Uh, there's something, they, they, they grab a hold of something, and they actually think that that thing needs them as well. This little bear actually needs them. You know, they, they feel connected to something. It's, and you see that in little kids and that thing, oftentimes it stays with us as we get older and we, we feel this obligation of a connection. Then as you begin to pull that into the social networking of just how we need to be around people and that, that need to be needed type of thing, the devil begin to use that. Well, you just don't need to be too far dedicated to me because then you're going to, You're going to isolate yourself. And the compromise is very subtle. Go to the Lord, serve the Lord, but don't go very far. You know, don't burn the bridge. You know, go over there for just a little while, but don't go far. Stay close enough where you can uh, come back, you know. The snare of it is this. It, It gives you an illusion. It gives you a false sense of security where you actually think you're serving God. Because you're actually doing some sacrificing, but you're still close enough. So I, I'm doing a little bit for God, so then I can get the monkey off my back, and I'm doing a little bit, so it's okay. That's a compromise, and that's a dangerous place to be. He says, you should not go very far away and treat for me. Makes it a lot easier to go back into Egypt when you don't go too far. Best thing to do is to burn your bridges all the way. Best thing to do is go ahead and make the make the break. And then you don't have to put up with it. You don't have to deal with it. The good example of that is Elisha. Whenever Elijah came to call him and he put his mantle on him, he says, let me go tell my mom and dad bye. And he took that yoke of oxen that he had worked with and he sacrificed them and killed them. He burned his bridges. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. They want to keep those connections The devil does that as a snare and as a chain, and he's got you. Um, This little boy, he kept waking up in the morning on the floor. (laughs) Every time he'd wake up, he's on the floor. And, you know, he'd just gotten big enough to kind of get in his own little bed and everything. And uh, his mom kept talking to him, what's going on, son? And finally he came to the realization, he says, Mom, I figured out the problem. I stay too close to the place where I get in. And you know, that's how a lot of Christians are. They get saved, but they just got out of the world, and they just got saved, but they stay right there where they got, right where they got in at. You need to just keep moving. And you don't have to be rude. You don't have to go up and cuss people out and tell them to get out of your face and do all that kind of stuff, but just keep getting closer to the Lord, and the closer you get to God, the more distance it's going to put between you and bad associations. Look, I know you have to associate with certain people. You have to work with them. You've got to rub shoulders. With them. I get that. I understand that. You can't just stick your head in the sand and be a monk in some monastery somewhere. However, some of you are keeping connections you have no business keeping. Tonight, Lord willing, 
I'm going to preach on Abraham and Lot. And the message is letting go of Lot. That's a hard thing to do. Lot was his nephew. And it came a point where nephew or not, we can't be around each other no more. A lot of times Christians will not make that choice, especially blood worms thicker than water. Things you will allow in your own family, you would never let a stranger come in your house and do. You would never let a stranger talk to you and be, act a certain way around you. But just because they got the same DNA, you lose your mind. You flip out. Who's more important, what God says in Jesus Christ or that sinner who happens to be related to you? Well, you just under, understand how I feel. Your feelings are immaterial, Christian. Hello? Amen. Your feelings don't matter. What matters is God's Word and what God tells you to do. That's all that matters. Amen. For a Christian, that's all that matters. Amen. Your feelings are immaterial. I'm sorry Amen. to squash your emotions and your feelings because everything about Christians nowadays is all about how they feel about it. Your feelings are your own idol. Your feelings are exalted above Jesus Christ. That's the problem. So then you're willing to compromise because of how you feel. When God tells you to do something, you do it. Regardless of feelings. So preacher, I want to have the right feeling. Well, you keep doing what God tells you to do, you'll have the right feeling. You'll have the joy in your heart. And you'll know, you know, I'm pleasing God and that's really what matters. And when I see God face to face, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be pleased that I obeyed Him. I'm going to be glad that I did what He told me to do. The compromise of correspondence. Just keep you connected. Keep you tied in. I told you about these two guys who are walking in the woods and they start they're just walking in trying to find up squirrels and stuff. They find this big hole, so just like guys do, start throwing stuff down it, you know, see if you can find the bottom of it. Stick, you know, get a big stick, stick. You can't find the bottom. They keep throwing. They can't even hear anything. They keep throwing stuff down this hole. They're looking around, look around. They see this railroad tie. They grab this old railroad tie. They drag it over there. They dump it down there, and they're listening out. Here directly, here comes this goat running by. And just jumps in the hole. I'm like, man, that is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. And they're sitting there looking, standing around this hole. A few more minutes go by, and this guy walks by and says, Hey, has anybody seen you? You've seen my goat? And they said, Crazy, you should say that. This goat came running, running by just a minute, jumped up and jumped down in this big old hole. He says, Man, that can't be my goat. My goat was tied to this railroad tie back here. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever pull a trailer or you pull a boat or something, you ever do that and you forget you're pulling something? And you glance in your rearview mirror and you think somebody's right behind you. You're like, whoa, what's that behind me? <laughs> Wherever you go, it's going. And when you're connected to something, you, don't, you say, well, I'm kind of over here. Yeah, but you're still tied to it. And it gives you a, a kind of a sense that you are separated, but not really. That's the danger of it. Now what happens after this, we have the judgments of the disease that happens on the cattle in chapter 9. The boils and blains, these sores break out on these Egyptians. A pestilence falls, this hail falls and destroys all the crops. Then we have, at the end of chapter um, uh, 9, we have the threat of these locusts in chapter 10. He tells them in chapter 10, I'm going to bring up these locusts. And he gives the threat of the judgment of the locusts. So Pharaoh says, okay, we'll make another compromise, verse 8. 10.8 Moses and Aaron were brought again unto Pharaoh and he said unto them Go serve the Lord your God but who are they that shall go? And Moses said we will go with our young with our old, with our sons, with our daughters with our flocks, with our herds will we go for we must hold a feast unto the Lord. And he said unto them Let the Lord be so with you as I will let you go and your little ones look to it for evil is before you. Not so. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord for that you did desire, they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. So what Pharaoh says is, look, the best thing to do is just let the men go. This is going to be dangerous. This is going to be hard. Leave your kids behind. Just let you men go and do this. This is a compromise of concern. You know what Satan will do? He will use anxiety and concern, even for others, to get you to compromise your convictions. That's what he does. It's very subtle because it's a counterfeit concern. You think Pharaoh really cares about those kids? He wants those kids as slaves. Think he really cares? 
You, let me say this. Uh, you think the government really cares about your kids? They're going to educate your kids to the best of their ability. Yeah, they're going to teach them how to turn into uh, weird people. Being nice. That's what they're going to educate them as soon as they're old enough to read. They're going to teach them that you can become whatever you want to be, man, woman, child, whatever. You can turn into whatever. That's what they're going to teach them. And maybe how to read and write. Don't even teach them how to write cursive anymore. Uh, I don't guess you need that. They'll teach them how to use a computer so they can get into trouble. Um, You think they really care about your kids? Do you think the devil really cares about people you care about? But he will use them as a subtle snare to keep a hold of you. The compromise of concern. It's a counterfeit. The sinfulness of it is this. If it's, if it's wrong for the men to stay in Egypt, it's wrong for the kids to stay in Egypt. Amen? It teaches your children the exact... Don't do as I say. Do as I, don't do as I do. Do as I say. Do you think that's really going to work? You men in here... How you treat your wives will be how your sons treat their wives. You say, why? Because they are learning how to treat a woman by watching their father. They will learn eating habits by watching their parents. They will learn potentially addictive habits with alcohol, with cigarettes, those types of things. You can't smoke. You're not 18 yet, but it's, it's wrong to do. What are you doing it for? They're just telling them, as soon as you're old enough, you can do it. Well, if it's wrong when you're 17, shouldn't it be? Well, it has nothing to do with right or wrong, according to the government. It has to do with money. And now everybody's on, I guess they're all on marijuana now. I don't know what, where the thing's going. If it's wrong, it's wrong. But the snare of it is that it puts a connection, especially with the children. The devil, he, he loves to use the children. The churches have... Uh, manipulated people with the children's programs because years ago preaching quit you know preachers quit preaching so people didn't come to church to hear preaching so they had to figure out some way to get these people in church so we got to come up with all these programs for their kids because moms and dads will come if their kids are doing some kind of program and grandparents will come to watch their kids do some kind of program so let's have all these programs in the church a lot of these churches wouldn't have a Wednesday night service if they didn't have a Wednesday night program for the kids. Because nobody would show up. They don't want to come here to Bible preached or taught. They want to come and do something with their kids or have a dinner. A lot of them wouldn't come if you didn't feed them. Feed them and they will come. <laughs> Amen. I like to eat too. But the main thing should be the main thing. And so what happens is the devil will use your children. Okay, well, you don't want to isolate your kids. If you keep them out of this situation and you don't let them experience this, then you're going to hurt your children. So therefore, I'm going to keep you connected to the world. The compromise of concern. And it creates, he'll use anxiety and concern to get you to disobey God. Any connection you have to Egypt will cause you to go back to Egypt. The best thing to do is to go ahead and take some risk and say, you know what? I mean, you think about some of these missionaries. They leave and they go to certain places and they take their families. You think, man, they're, they're having to risk uh, taking their families to these places, different diseases. You can get sick here in America, amen? People are getting sick here in America. The best thing to do is to do what God tells you to do, regardless of what the world tries to say. And the world will try to use... This false concern. The last one here in chapter number 10. Chapter number 10. He sends the darkness, the plague. Of course, he sends the locusts. Then he sends the darkness. But the children of Israel have light. And then Pharaoh calls, verse number 24, Moses. Look what he says. You think he's there. You think he's at the point to let him go. Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. I'll let you take your kids too. Verse 25 of Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also shall go with us. There shall not an hoof be left behind, for thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we know not with what we must serve the Lord until we come thither. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. The compromise of capital. See, what is that? That's your assets, the things that you have. 
He doesn't want you to give anything to Him. This has to do with the sacrifice of the resources. They're going out into the wilderness. Pharaoh says, well, leave all your cattle, all your flocks. Leave, leave all your, your things behind. Moses is like, well, that's why we're taking it there so we can give it to God, so we can sacrifice it. The Lord wants us to sacrifice these animals to Him. Pharaoh's like, you just leave that behind. And the devil will allow you to go so far in your Christian life, he'll actually actually allow you to separate yourself some in your separation and maybe sanctification. He might even let you serve a little. But when we start talking about sacrifice, that's when we start talking about worship. Those things are connected. You cannot worship God without sacrifice. And that's where a lot of Christians never get into the place of worshiping God because they're not willing to to sacrifice. They still see their life as their life. God, I'll give you this little piece of my life. Lord, I'll let you have this little thing so I can feel better. That's not a sacrifice. When the woman brought the alabaster box of ointment, that box was a year's wage. And she busted it and put it at Christ's feet and destroyed it. And Judas and the others standing there, look, we could have taken that and sold it and given it to the poor. Jesus said she did the right thing. She wasted it on me. A sacrifice. The world looks at your sacrifices like it's a waste. You know what you could be doing on this pretty morning? Man, some of you that play golf, you could be out knocking around a little plastic ball. You ladies, you could be, you know, shopping, I guess, if you still shop, or shopping on Amazon or something. Uh, You could be out trying to catch a fish. You could be making some overtime. You could always work on Sunday morning. Sunday morning is a good time to work. Sacrifice. Capital. When you start talking about money, people get nervous. The thing is, it's okay to have money as long as money doesn't have you. There was this older couple, and they go to the fair every year. You know how, I remember years ago, my dad and I, we got to ride up in a helicopter at this little festival thing. That was a lot of fun. And they'll do things like that. And they had this particular fair this older couple went to. And every year they'd go and they had these, these little Cessna planes, you know. And this guy had these planes and he'd take people up on plane rides. And every year this old man was like, I want to go up on one of the planes one year. And, uh, but it was always, you know, it was $10 a ride back in the day. <laughs> and, uh, and him and his wife would look at that and she'd say, yeah, but $10 is $10. And he'd say, yeah, I know. And uh, they do that every year, and they come up one year, and they go up to the guy, and they're looking at the plane, so the people come back, and they're all happy, and he's like, man, I sure want to go up there. And she's like, yeah, but $10 is $10, and the pilot overhears them. And he says, look, hey, look, and I hear y'all, y'all been talking up a storm, going back and forth about this. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take both of you up. If you will keep your mouth shut the entire time, I'll let you have it for free. But if you open your mouth, if you say one word, it's $10. They said, okay, that's a good deal, you know. So they got in the plane, and they went up, and boy, that pilot, he was going to get his money. He went, and he did all kind of tricks and turns, and he was turning sideways up and down loops and all kind of crazy uh, stuff. And, uh, and he starts pulling in. As he's, as he's landing, he yells back at the old man in there. He says, look. He goes, man, I thought I almost, uh, lo- I thought I, uh, thought I had you. I thought y'all were going to say anything. And the old man says, yeah. He goes, I almost did when Martha fell out, but $10 $10. <laughs> That's how some people are, you know. Ten dollars or ten dollars. You go out and eat, and you leave that fifty cent down. You think you did a good job leaving fifty cent tip. Look, we are not in nineteen fifty anymore. Amen. Some of y'all got to step up with inflation. A twenty dollar bill is not a lot of money anymore. When I was a kid. Twenty dollars, like whoa, twenty dollars. Twenty dollars, like a hundred dollar bill now. But I know how we are, and I'm the same way. You get stuck in a certain thing. You think everything's like it was 20. It ain't like it was. But the devil will use the compromise of assets. The subtlety of it is this. You could leave all this stuff behind, and you wouldn't have as hard a journey. I will go ahead and let you go now. I've already made all these compromises. Pharaoh's saying, look, all you have to do is this one thing. Just hold back this one small thing and you can do anything else with the Lord you can have at it. Plus, you get to take your entire family. Kids get to go. Letourneau, the famous uh, tractor guy, you know, he made a, a lot of the different inventions with the bulldozers and all that stuff. He was a Christian man. Gave away millions of dollars. 
lost a lot of money too, but you read some of his testimony. He said this, it's not how much money I give to God, but how much of God's money I keep for myself. Think about it that way. Every dime you have is God's money. How much are you keeping it for you? But the assets, the compromise of capital, what are you going to sacrifice the Lord with? Sacrifice can be more than just uh, your talent as far as a piece of money. It can be your time. It takes time to do things for the Lord. It takes time to pray for people. It takes time to go out of your way to help somebody. It could be your talents. Some of you have some abilities to do things. And God says, I want that for me. Are you willing? No compromise, Moses says. I can't sacrifice to God without these. You've got to get to the place where you're willing to say, it's either God's way or no way. The devil will come in and he's always, just make this compromise. Just, make, just give me a little here. I'll let you have this much, but don't go all the way. Here's the thing. We, do all, we all do it with the Lord. We're willing to give God certain rooms in our house. But then there are certain closets we have the locks on. And we wonder why we're having problems with chains and things like that in our lives. It's because you haven't given Him that closet. And until you're completely honest with the Lord and you're willing to let Him have it all, there's always going to be that that bondage and that chain. The devil will use that stuff against you. You've got to let go. And be willing to let him have it all. You say, preacher, I, I, I see the burning bush. I hear the call. I don't want these chains on me anymore. I want to I wanna get the world out of me. I want to be close to God. Well, as soon as you make that decision, the devil's going to show up with his compromises. In some way, he's going to have you connected. I, I'm pretty radical. I know. You call me crazy. There may come a time, I just read a testimony of a man. He was actually a police officer. Nothing. I'm not telling you police officers to quit your job, but I read a testimony of a man, and he was saved, loved God, but he, in his situation, he knew he had to get another job, and he moved his whole family. And months after he moved, he got another job. He had his weekends. He had his time. He said it transformed his whole family. So what happened? He lost some money because of different things, but it changed his whole life. Christians don't even think that way. They think, oh, there's a job opportunity here. Okay, is there going to be a church to go to? I uh, hadn't thought about that. I already got a house. I bought a house. Where are you going to go to church? Well, I've got a job. It should be the other way around. But it's not. And they wonder why they have all these chains on them. You're living for yourself. The thing to do is to be willing to say, okay, Lord, I'm not going to buy into these compromises. I'm going to let you have it. Uh, if you've heard about the Emperor Charlemagne, what he would do, he'd have his soldiers baptized before they go off the war. As the tradition goes, some of them would practice the baptism for an immersion in, in the water, in the creeks. And the soldiers, they would keep their right hand out, and the, the, the hand they would be killing people with, with the sword. They'd baptize everything but that hand. That's how a lot of Christians are. Every other area of their life, they'll let go, but that there's one little area where there's a chain, where there's a habit, where there's a hold, where there's some bondage that the world's got you right there. And until you're willing to say, okay, Lord, I'm not compromising with that, then Satan's going to use that one thing to hold on to you. Let's have a word of prayer to close out the service. Ask our pianist to come, just a brief invitation.